So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. If you're joining us from still cold but bright Montreal, if you're joining us as our distinguished guest, Duki Dror, yeah, is doing from Israel or from different parts of Europe, a beautiful good late afternoon or a beautiful good early evening to you. My name is Chaba Nicolini. I'm director of the Azraeli Institute of Israel Studies, also professor of political science at Concordia University. And I'm truly so delighted uh, to welcome you to yet another very important event uh, that we are hosting here under the auspices of the Institute. As I have been saying for the last couple of weeks, March 20, 2022 is Israeli Documentary Month here at the Institute. And we truly are so fortunate to be able to bring to you um, a treasure, a gem of the Israeli documentary film industry, Mr. Duki Dror and his film, initially made as a film series. What you were able to watch yesterday on your computer screen was the film uh, version of it inside the Mossad. What I would like to do uh, is to give you a brief introduction of Duki and then open up the conversation with um, a monopoly time, if you will. I would like to keep the, uh, the privilege of the first few questions to myself, um, but I do promise not to overdo it. I have been getting a lot of feedback and all well taken. I am very conscious of the need to give you an opportunity to ask your questions and offer your comments uh, to Duki. Uh, after all, you came, you watched the film, and once again, you're joining us, and it is only right that you should not be deprived of the opportunity to engage directly with Duki. So without further ado, let me do the unconventional. Instead of regurgitating what I received as the official biography of Duki's, I am going to actually read out to you in first person singular, how Duki is introducing himself to his viewers and to his readers on his own uh, website. And it is really quite incredible. Uh, I was really captivated by it. But here it is in first person singular, information about me, about Duki. Growing up in Tel Aviv, I studied photography in high school. I would walk along the Yarkon Riverbank which used to be a dump, and one of the more gloomy areas in the city, and I took pictures of various scrap objects, syringes, dead animals, and things washed up by the river along the bank. It was like going inside the belly of a beast and documenting what is hidden from the eye. In the last class before graduation, I was given an assignment of making a five-minute documentary. I read about a special program that ran by long-term prison inmates who teach illiterate inmates how to read and write. I asked for permission to document it. My first interviewees were convicted murderers and the experience was simply enthralling. Meeting with people that I could never have met otherwise, learn how they think, what their stories are. It took a year and a half to finish my first documentary. Sentenced to Learn was the title. To my utter surprise, the film was invited to a prestigious festival in the Pompidou Center in Paris for a series called Landmarks in American Documentary Film. In Paris, I met the American documentary filmmakers that I had just learned about in school. Al Meisers, Richard Leacock, Ross McHugh, um, Alan Berliner, and others, whose films screened in this series. My student film was shown alongside leading filmmakers, and it really was a pivotal moment for me. Later, I moved to the United States and studied in Chicago and Los Angeles. I was influenced by the French New Wave and experimental cinema, uh, various abstract films, uh, which draw directly on the celluloid. I was exposed to these films for the first time and was captivated. Until my last semester, all my short films were scripted and I had no interest in documentary work. 25 years after my first student film, I made Inside the Mossad, sitting and talking with secretive Mossad agents, people that you would never otherwise meet, took me back to my first film with the prison inmates. 
getting intimate with a subject and people that are far from the eye. Documentary filmmaking is a fascinating journey, usually painful and bruising too, that lets you understand the world better and to expose your perception of it to your viewers. So ladies and gentlemen, with those words, I am now giving you Duki Dror. So Duki, thank you so much for joining us. And really thank you for those words. I have to, I have to tell you that I, I watched the film a long time before I read and researched uh, you and found um, your words about yourself. Now that I know that there is a connection between inside the Mossad and your very first documentary, I'm not surprised by the opening scenes. Like the opening scenes of Inside the Mossad almost feel like the spy masters are being interrogated, interrogated. And perhaps that was intentional. But that's my observation. Um, Duki, please tell us a little bit about the history of the film. 25 years after your first documentary, why make a film about the Mossad? And why? I mean, we understand now why this topic is so special. I mean, you like these very interesting subject matters. But why? then? Why now? So take us on a journey about the genesis of the film until yesterday when our viewers were able to watch it on their screens in Montreal. Well, th first, thank you for, for reading it. I, I forgot about all this uh, text, so it was nice to hear it again. Um, well, I think that uh, for me, uh, this is, um, you know, making documentaries and, and engaging with people uh, that uh, otherwise you you wouldn't uh, have, you know, you wouldn't, just a second, I have to, to, to do something here. Uh, sorry. Uh, getting the, 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 the sorry, <laughs> I, have, I have some technical problem here. Okay, got it. Uh, I, it is, you know, it is to to find the 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 you know you 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 live in this world and you try to to find the essence of the world, and you sometimes you need to go uh, to to the places that, that you you're not really supposed to go to to understand it, and so I think that is the connection uh, between uh, sentence to learn, getting to hearing these people you otherwise you wouldn't you know, meet and try to understand to their uh, way of thinking, which is, you know, they are very smart people. They did something, you know, those that I, uh, I interviewed and they just made uh, some decision that put them in jail uh, or the circumstances of, of their life got them in, in where they, they, uh, they uh, uh, ended up. Uh, and I think that in a way that the, the, the Mossad agents are, uh, they had the circumstances of, of life to get them where they are. Mm. And <clears throat> perhaps there's some, you know, uh, criminal mind, which I would not say that it is all bad, but there's also some creative um, creative uh, process that had, has in the mind of people who are doing these jobs, <laughs> being criminal, criminals and, and, and being in, in the, uh, this uh, um, in the Mossad. And the, the thing is that the, the, those people in the Mossad has to always deal with moral dilemmas and they are very conscious of these moral dilemmas. Uh, and that was super interesting for me. So really it started um, two, two, three, two years before, you know, camera was uh, uh, in front of the first interviewee. Uh, I, I read a book uh, by Yossi Melman, it's called Imperfect Spies. I, I watched uh, uh, series like uh, The Americans. Uh, I read uh, John Le Carre. So popular um, 
culture is is really full of of these um, experiences of spies, and it's it's a very uh, interesting uh, life to to explore to understand how people are in dilemmas and what they do in these dilemmas. And after I read Yossi Melman's uh, book, I, I engaged him. He's a uh, He's a, a, a journalist, uh, Israeli journalist, wrote a few books about the Mossad, and he had some connection to, to uh, access to some of the people. But it took a long time to really establish some kind of, of uh, um, um, connection or that they will trust you. Uh, there were, you know, most of the time there were just, uh, they, they didn't want to engage. Nobody, nobody wanted to engage. You have to go through uh, the channels, to, but there's no channel. There's no like phone number. You can call, hello, hi, this is the Mossad. Can I, I want to, to, to interview some of your ex uh, agents. Is that okay? So you cannot really do that. And you need uh, to use uh, all kinds of ways. And Israel is a, is a small place and, when you find somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody, then suddenly you 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 find the crack to go in and and try to to hold something to be uh, able to 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 work out another meeting with another person who finally it took, it took about two years until we got. Uh, the access to 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 do this project to, to get the, the the approval uh, to do it, so that's how it started. And usually, you know, it, it's just really something that it happens to me all the time. I read something, uh, and it, it's you know, it just blinks in my head. Wow, this is interesting. Let's do. Let's see if if it's possible. And. Um, and many times it's possible. That's what's what's pretty amazing. If you really want to do things, it it, it happens. So if the time if our time permits, I would like to come back maybe towards the end to this issue of what are you reading now, so so that we could predict what your next project possibly might be. But before uh, before we would get there, Duki, um, I would like to uh, ask you to react and maybe clarify something that you mentioned at the very beginning of the film. And that is that historically, these Mossad, uh, aid, Mossad leaders, for lack of a better word, let me call them that, and, and really all agents are, have been refusing to, uh, they, they didn't want to be interviewed. But clearly something must have changed either in their policy, maybe the policy of the organization, or maybe in the ethos, maybe the culture um, that allowed some of these extremely senior person uh, individuals to actually open up and um, entertain being interviewed by you. It still wasn't easy, as you said, it took two years, but after two years, still, it was possible for you to make the film. So what changed? Do you have a sense of what made it possible for you to make the, this film now, which clearly wouldn't have been possible uh, perhaps a decade or two decades ago? You know, actually, it's it's and now it's it's also impossible to do it again. I mean, after the release of this film and the series, they you know they uh, stopped uh, communication with the media as it was in 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 you know as it was uh, used in this uh, in this film and this project. So uh, I think it was a one time. For now, maybe it will change. Um, but I think that there are a few things that uh, allowed it to, to, to happen. One, there was a film uh, that came out in 2013. It was called uh, The Gatekeepers. Uh, it was about Shabak yeah. uh, leaders, yeah. the, the six heads of the Shabak, the internal security, Israeli internal security. And that was... I think a groundbreaking uh, film that uh, suddenly uh, was cracking the, the the silence behind the the Israeli intelligence community. Suddenly, uh, these heads of Shabak came 
up front and uh, did these interviews in this uh, very successful film. So I think that was one, uh, one thing that paved the way for this. And uh, when I, when we started to, we, we began to, to um, the negotiation or the, the, the discussions to, to, to get an approval from, from uh, actually it's, it's the, um, uh, the uh, prime minister office, which is, you know, the Mossad is at the pri- in the prime minister office and the UN need to go through uh, the, the prime minister office. Uh, and and they they just you know decline again and again and again and again. I think there was a crack, just like uh, a small crack between in 2015, I think it was 16, 16 maybe, uh, when uh, Tamil Paudo was the head of Mossad and uh, Yossi Cohen uh, took his place, replaced him, and I think Yossi Cohen had the idea that Mossad should be uh, uh, more open to media. And he greenlighted this as soon as he came into office, I think a month or two months after he came into office. That's what I heard. I didn't know, I don't, I didn't, never had a a paper says that uh, Mossad is greenlighting this project, but I knew that Mm -hmm. it was okay. And um, so I think that's why it happened. Uh, but after the film came out, I think the, the, the intelligence community or the Mossad, ex-Mossad uh, uh, employees were divided into two groups. One that were very happy about the film and the series and uh, the other half were uh, not very happy about uh, having this exposed as it was. So actually that brings me to the next question very nicely, um, Duki, uh, and that's about the reception of the film. So now you sort of offered this very nice segue into uh, painting this uh, picture of a divided Mossad family in terms of reacting to the film. Um, How did that manifest itself? in the Israeli media, on social media, in the newspapers, or did you get direct communication from the different uh, parts, if you will, of the Mossad family? And how did the rest of Israel react uh, to your film? How was the film and the series in general received? Uh, in the same split fashion that you just described to us, or non-Mossad Israel had a different attitude, a different approach, uh, a different reception of the film? There was a great interest uh, in the film and in the series. Well, first the series came out in Israel and it was, you know, big success. It was a riot. I mean, everybody wanted to, to watch it. It was, I think the first time the series was on a documentary channel in the beginning and then it was on the uh, uh, um, um, uh, commercial channel. They, they, they purchased, purchased it for, for airing and then uh, finally, on the uh, public t- television channel. So, all uh, TV uh, platforms really uh, aired it because it was so popular. And of course, it's popular because Israeli people really want to hear about the myth of Mossad and they want to know the, the story behind the story. I mean, everyone wants to know the story behind the story. Uh, I mean, that's what actually uh, intrigued me in getting to, to, to understand not only the human dilemmas, but also to really to go into the story behind the story of many things that uh, were described in the film. And uh, so there was a lot of attention in Israel. And then of course, there was a lot of attention in the, in, in the world. Uh, it was screened, in, uh, in um, Germany and France and had like a huge rating. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, then it was purchased in, uh, by, uh, by uh, Netflix. And then it was, uh, for me as, as a, for, for my career, it really was a game changer because after it was on, on Netflix, things really 
um, you know, a lot of people watched it then, and and my ability to to go to a more interesting, uh, 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 bigger projects, more complicated co projects, uh, was uh, got easier after that. That's um, that's but wonderful. I think yeah. Also, mm -hmm. also if I, I if I look if I uh, you know when I I can tell you that. Reading uh, talkbacks and things like that, reactions that of public, uh, of course there were uh, there was a division in them uh, between those who said, "Oh, this is uh, uh, blasphemy that uh, we are uh, showing all the Israeli has to to show all the the uh, secrets of the Mossad, and this is how the." Uh, enemy will learn and, you know, uh, will be defeated. Israel will be defeated because of this. So there were always the part of, of those who, who thought this is, a, a, this is a really blasphemous uh, uh, thing to, to have. Um, there is a very interesting quote. And I think it's either a quote or maybe this is your, these are your own words. Uh, Doki, I don't know. Um, in the film, where you describe intelligence agencies mm. in general as a nation's subconscious. It's not mine. It's, it's uh, John Lacare. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Now, I mean, uh, there are other yeah. Lacare quotes, of course, uh, that you problematize yeah. in the film. So um, taking that, um, mm -hmm. what are we to learn? What did you want to show? What did you want to teach? and communicate to your viewers about Israel's, the Israeli nation's subconscious through portraying the Mossad. It's complex. I know, but I'm, you know, I think that uh, you can look at it as, as um, uh, the way, you know, the, the 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 idea uh, that Mossad was created as to be this agency, to be this body that will prevent the next uh, Holocaust, the never again. This idea that we cannot have uh, another Holocaust and will do anything to prevent it, and I think. There is, if you look at this, you know, if you ask what is the, the subconscious of, of, of the Israeli society looking at the Mossad, actually, you know, the first time that I was asked this question, so I'm, I'm trying to think while you asked this, sure. but I think it, it has to do with uh, the, the thrill of this myth which mm -hmm. is bigger than life, looking at these people that in, in awe, and uh, also this uh, sense of uh, survival, survival to do these things and to, to fight uh, and to be, to feel the, 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 that you are the, the victim of, of, of history. And therefore, you have to do anything to survive. So I think these things are, um, you know, um, are the the center of 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 the Mossad, and you can see it if you if you if you try to X-ray the the subconscious of Israeli society. Yeah. I think yeah. this is it. Thank you, thank you. That's uh, that's a very very helpful answer. Very helpful clarification, Duke. Um, I'm. Looking at the time, wanting to make sure that I uh, do leave plenty of uh, space to our viewers. So I'm coming slowly to the end of my questions, but I do want to ask and probe you a, a little bit, Duki, if I may, about the, some of the interviewees. Um, you showed very honestly on the screen the, sometimes the great hesitation that some of the Mossad chiefs had about sitting uh, in the chair, being uh, not interrogated, but interviewed, wanting to control the process, 
feeling very uncomfortable when the questions didn't go the way they wanted to. On the other hand, we also, we also saw Ram Ben Barak, whom you opened with and you are so close with, maintaining tremendous control and maintaining exactly that thrill that you have just described. I mean, I, time and time I watched and rewatched what he was saying about maintaining the image of the Mossad, never saying quite the truth, but just saying enough so that that thrill <laughs> would always be maintained. And at the end of the film, when you asked him, have you made a difference? Is there one thing that you would be able to pinpoint where you really made a difference? He leaves you hanging. He says, you know what? No, I'm not going to answer that question. So that thrill is just continuing. Um, and then, of course, Rafi Eitam. You brought us Rafi Eitam, you know, the, cat, uh, the, um, uh, the famous, famous agent turned politician who, who brought Eichmann to, uh, to Jerusalem. Um, can you tell a little bit, Duki, about your relationship and your observation about the interviewees? Um, did they change throughout the process? Or the ones that felt really uncomfortable at the beginning, did they remain as such throughout? Did they learn? Did they change their behavior and attitude throughout this process? And did they know about each other? Did they know um, whom else were you interviewing? So anything that you can open up and share with us about what you observed about your interviewees would be great. Well, well first, I have to, to, uh, uh, to tell you something very interesting. Uh, with what's going on in, in uh, Ukraine now. So my uh, German partner, who partnered with me to do this, uh, the Mossad, and from there we did everything else, all, all the other projects that we did uh, afterwards. But he, you know, I, I asked him uh, I, a month ago, I said, listen, this is very scary what's going on in Ukraine. And he said, no, nothing, well, nothing will happen. Putin will not invade. And just... Uh, a few days ago, he was calling me and said, oh, he was, he was in panic and said, can't the Mossad do something? Can't they send somebody to, to assassinate Putin? Can you, can you talk to someone? So I think even though, you know, he knows, you know, the, the myth of the Mossad, it's still very strong. And so that's a, that's a, a little story. But uh, with the, the interviewees, yes, it was like an interrogation for them, I think. And, and uh, that was a very peculiar uh, experience to do this because uh, some of the interviews, I think the first interview, actually, I was bummed. I think I was, you know, I got, uh, you know, I, I was, you know, it didn't go well. I felt that the the um, uh, operative that I was interviewing is just like being uh, uh, um, a dick. Sorry to say that, and and being uh, not really answering my question, but always trying to manipulate me uh, in the interview. And I was going to my uh, cameraman and my producer, and I said, "Oh no, this is not going to work there." They are too manipulative to, to interview, and I don't know if I can do that. And they said, no, this was great. Wow. This was a great interview. And I looked at it later on, and I saw that, you know, the camera really captured all the manipulation, the way that, you know, that, you know, it, it's just was very present how they are being manipulative if they are uh, hiding uh if they are and, and it's it's hard to to uh, lie to the camera i think mm -hmm. except ram ben barak who's really uh i think one of the those who are uh you know he's like um, we don't know really what he thinks and he's very uh solid in in what he says uh, and uh, well they didn't know that who else is interviewed. Maybe they did, but I didn't tell them who is going to be interviewed. And and they were interviewed um, each only once, so or, or twice. Some of them were twice, but not not all of them. 
some of them were very uh it was very uh funny in a black comedy kind of um way like like coffee tan and coffee tan that was very strange uh later on we saw in the you know in the high resolution 4k that there was a little warm coming in from his uh uh jacket <laughs> in one of the shots so it was so so weird anyway that was there were um it was a challenge to interview them it was a, a sci- sort of a mind game to do it it was like a check game and i liked it I, in the beginning i was i was scared about it i said oh no this is too complicated they are too complicated people to to interview they are not uh, honest but uh from you know later on from one interview to another i i I found how to to do it and and get what I want so that was uh, yeah and we are very thankful uh, that you did that Duki that uh, because the end product is really a, a, a thrilling thank you fascinating uh, and very engaging film as a last question from me um, and there are already questions and comments coming into the chat that I'm going to share with you in a moment um, let me just go back uh, to you to the question about what you're reading now and therefore what your next project uh, or next projects uh, will be I am are you going to stick to the uh, to the theme of um, spying to the theme of intelligence uh, the national uncovering other layers of the national subconscious can you tell us a little bit about what your next projects are going to be or uh, do you if you want to keep us in suspense that is uh, perfectly okay <laughs> Well, uh, the, the, the next project I did after Mossad was uh, Lebanon, Lebanon uh, um, Borders of Blood. This was a series also that, uh, uh, was, uh, that came out uh, last year. Uh, and uh, in Israel, uh, Canada, no, sorry, uh, and Europe. And uh, it's about, uh, it's sort of the, the Vietnam War of Israel, uh, the, 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 the involvement of Israel in, in the wars in Lebanon since the 50s, 70s and on. And uh, this was a project that came out of, of, of the Mossad because uh, some of these uh, Uh, one of them one of the the uh, um, interviewees in the Mossad was uh, you know I was I was pretty fascinating from his stories about Lebanon and I wanted to go in and I found a, a huge story about Lebanon how you know all you know it's it's like the uh, the the way every uh, single um, mistake in, 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 in could could happen for every force that try to invade this country or uh, get to intervene in this country if it's the, the, the Israelis the Palestinians the Syrians the the Iranians the Americans everybody just got knocked out when you Uh, they got uh, involved in, in Lebanon so uh, and and uh, to, at, wh- while I was uh, working on Lebanon I read this uh, article on political uh, about uh, um, a story called um, project Cassandra and pa- project Cassandra uh, is uh, as a series of um, uh, Uh, of uh, uh, operations taken by uh, the American Drug Enforcement Administration uh, through the years 2006 to 2015 uh, to uh, try to expose uh, the, the system of money laundering and drug trafficking by the Uh, Hezbollah and Iran engaging with um, the cartels in, in South America and getting the produce into uh, 
to terror. So it's about the narco terror story and a big, huge operation that was stopped uh, while the American administration uh, was engaged in talks in Vienna in 2013 to 2015 with, uh, uh, with Iran on the nuclear deal. And then uh, they just stopped it. And this is the new story. It's, it's actually, it's quite amazing that this is, it's going to be uh, um, released very, very soon. And it's just at the same time when history is also happening in, 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 uh, in Vienna now. That's uh, another extremely topical and very, very important contribution. And we wish you best of luck and much, much success, of course, with Thank you. that project as well. And, uh, and clearly, it has a Canadian component. So uh, we will be delighted to, uh, to advertise it and, and showcase it and, and also welcome you back uh, for another. Well, we will be seeing you later on this month when we'll talk about your other movie about uh, there are no lions in Tel Aviv. But of course, we look forward to, to talking to you further, Duki, when uh, the Cassandra project is out. And so, um, friends, uh, let me now turn to the comments and questions that came in through the chat. And uh, the first one is from Miriam. Uh, Miriam Shankar is asking, Duki, what your thoughts are about the recent media exposure of the past director, Yossi Cohen? Um, if you have any thoughts, um, uh, any reactions, um, Miriam would like to know. Well, it doesn't put them on, on a really a good spot, I think. Uh, I don't know. I never spoke with Yossi Cohen, so I don't know him. I just know uh, secondhand, uh, you know, things about him. So I don't really want to comment on something that I, I know only from the media. So, But I, I think that his... Um, uh, interviews uh, were problematic, I think, and uh, but I don't know. It's it's something that uh, uh, I, you know I I don't know enough to to comment about really. Okay, but you know from I I just this is something that I myself didn't uh, uh, um, research, so I better not. That's very fair. Um, uh, so, but thank you for the question and thank you for the honest uh, answer, Duki. Uh, a comment from Irving, Irving Epstein. Watching the documentary, Duki, gave me, you gave me the impression that life is not important. You have your target, I understand, but why kill those who just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time? A quote from Eye in the Sky, which said, never tell a soldier that he doesn't know the cost of war. Um, if you want to react, to this comment, uh, please do. If not, I will move to that. No, I think it's it's a, it, it, it's a valid point. I mean, this is a, it's it's a, it's a dirty business, and uh, uh, I don't think that uh, this is something that I would want to engage in myself. But I know that there are uh, some. Uh, you know, the, the world is, is quite a, a dangerous uh, and uh, uh, dangerous place. And uh, there are people who this is, you know, engage in this kind of, of work. And uh, my, uh, you know, what I'm trying to understand is uh, there you know, how they look at life, how they look at what they do, how they are, you know, they, uh, they reading, they're reading on, on history and also their inner reading, how their uh, uh, self, how their uh, 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 individualism, their individual um, experience uh, in, uh, intersects with historical points. And that's what uh, fascinating me to, to learn. I mean, that's the story, looking for the story uh, uh, through their experience and through their dilemmas and pain and, you know, 
they're all, I think they're all quite, uh, you know, uh, are damaged in a way. Uh, so, you know, damaging the soul. I mean, people who are engaged in kind of this kind of, of, uh, of engagement, looking at, uh, you know, having, you know, they, most of them are not really, you know, the, 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 the part where, Mossad is engaging in killing, uh, targeting killing is very, very, very limited. I mean, it's very small. They are more into, uh, now is more into Signet, and, but they were uh, human uh, getting information uh, more, not killing people. Uh, this is, I think the targeted killing is a very minute part of their uh, work, but still, you know, people who you give license to kill are, you know, that they are different. Thank you, Duque. Uh, very, another very interesting point and question from Asfar Adib, and Asfar's question is as follows. Amazing documentary. While doing the interviews, did you feel that these super smart people of the Mossad can play more constructive roles as well. Recent examples, securing critical material, critical stuff during COVID or facilitating peace talks, activities that remain underrated under their typical uh, image. So thinking not just about the regional, but also uh, about global, global issues and politics. So what's, as far would you like think... your thoughts, yeah? So I, I think that's a, that's a, that's a very, uh problematic thing. I mean, during the, the years of uh, Netanyahu, especially during the years of Netanyahu, uh, there was a tendency of Netanyahu to make the Mossad, and, and more through the, the uh, through Yossi Cohen, which was uh, uh, very close to Netanyahu, but also through the Malal, the, the uh, uh, Council for National Security, uh, they are. They became like uh, uh, the foreign ministry, doing things, covert things. Uh, uh, but they they were, uh, in principle, uh, sort of uh, the uh, uh, foreign ministry. And I think this is uh, damaging democracy. This is not the way it should be. I mean, there should be uh, separation from uh, 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 from civil uh, to military, and and civil should should stay, st stick to civil mm -hmm. uh, issues. And because the, the, then it's just like a, a very um, uh, slippery uh, road to, to take. Thank you, Duki. Um, Duki, I'm looking at the time and um, I'm going to read or share with you one more comment and then two questions. And then that uh, will allow mm -hmm. us to, not to, to make sure that we are not uh, exceeding the one hour for which we asked uh, for your commitment to. So a uh, very important comment from uh, Rachel Akalai uh, from Montreal, and here is the comment. We saw their pain with the death of Ashram Marwan, Nasser's son-in-law, and the fact that they could not protect him. Clearly they have consciences, and I wonder if that can be applied to other spies in other agencies, such as the KGB. So if you have any reaction, thoughts, or knowledge about other spies, Spies or other at other agencies, Duki. Is there anything you would like to? Maybe you know, Ashraf Marwan is a very interesting story, which is not really clear. That uh, uh, there is so many versions to this story, which I, I'm not sure which one is the truth. One was he uh, uh, an agent, uh, uh, a Egyptian agent, or Israeli agent, or double agent, and who is he working for? Mostly, it's very, very. Uh, it's a still something that not really clear yet uh, after all these years. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, I think you know if, uh, it's the, the the story of uh, double agents and uh, uh, getting rid of of uh, of agents who doubled. Who are double? This is part of the this uh, clandestine war uh, where you know engaging uh, everywhere in, in in the world. So it's happening all the time, I guess. 
I don't you, have a specific. I don't think that the, uh, I, Mossad uh, actually killed somebody with polonium. So, <laughs> I don't point, think so. point point taken. Point taken. So, uh, <laughs> a question from uh, Ellen Fru, and then there will be one more question in the end. And Ellen's question goes mm -hmm. as follows: In the film, you ask one of the agents if you should use her real name or a cover name, Yael or Ella, and she responds with right. Amitamar. I'll assume that neither Yael nor Ella is her real name, or the subtitles didn't correctly capture the exchange. Is that a fair assumption, or did the real name slip through? No, no, we couldn't really give, give her name, so it was uh, sort of a, a cover name. Uh, Yael and Ella, it's, it's a cover name, it's not the real name. Yeah. yeah. And uh, last question goes to Professor uh, Yaron Shemer, and uh, we are delighted uh, that you're with us. Uh, so, Professor Shamer, if you're still here, you ask, to, uh, ask the question directly uh, as opposed to mediated uh, through me. So I'm delighted, of course, but please come uh, and unmute yourself. Yaron, if you're... Yeah, I did unmute. Yeah, wonderful, you can wonderful. hear me. Yeah, yeah. Please, uh, yeah. thank you very much and uh, good to see, Hi, to see you in UK again. Good Anna. to see you. Yeah, and uh, thank you, everyone. Good to see you. So, uh, uh, Duke, a quick question, because I know we are running out of time. And I want to come back to the opening scene, actually, that uh, Chaba actually mentioned and had his uh, way of looking at that. And I want to come out uh, to, uh, to ask you uh, something else about the opening scene. We, we all know the opening scene and the, usually the concluding scenes are the most important in some ways because they frame the whole film in a way. And you decided not to start with information, with dates, with anything, you know. The first thing that we really know is, in a way, I cannot make the film that I want to make. I mean, this is me saying that, yeah? And basically they are telling me how to do it and what to, 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 to and the way to do it. So my question to you is, a you know, I'm asking you specifically as a, as a one who wanted to come up with the best film possible, most effective. Was it also a way for you, a stratagem for you, basically, to basically explain off why uh, some things are not included in the film? Because even if it's targeted uh, killing, I can think of several other things that are not there. If it's not targeted killings only, obviously there were major other things that uh, you could talk about. Another way, and I'm concluding with that, is it a way for you also to kind of distance yourself from that? You know, you are saying, you know, they basically did whatever they wanted. I'm not responsible for that. So that's kind of a tricky thing, but I really would appreciate your, your comment. A great question. Thank you. Thank you, Yara. Well, well, thank you, Yawanga, for this question. All, all the answers are right. I mean, and also I will add to that. This is a, a, a storytelling technique of getting... Uh, the audience engage into this. Okay, we are have a problem here. I mean, you just lay the, the the feeling that I had in the beginning, my first interview. I wanted to to let the audience just feel this uh, this problem, this uh, 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 this problem of of making such a film for me uh, as you know, and that I think also uh, brings you in, engage you in because you want to see if, if this film is going to solve this problem. Are they going to talk? Are they going to, to give their heart in it or not? And I, I, you know, I think that the, you nailed a few things I didn't think about that. I think also it's a, it's a good way of, you know, you always, you, you know, I feel very close to the people I, I interview. It doesn't matter what they are, are they, the, if they are, um, Hamas uh, terrorists or uh, ex-convicts or uh, Mossad or whatever. And because I think I just want to, to dive into their mind and, and get the honesty and bring them, uh, bring the story from, from, you know, that as honest as possible. But then you have to to really to say, oh, okay, uh, really, do I really um, am I hundred? Am I really can and they identify with this 
person. So yeah, I mean, it's it's a way of of having something in between and and creating this barrier, which is uh, I I for for the for the sake of this film I crossed. Yaron is the, great, great. Uh, what a wonderful and perfect way of ending this fascinating, engaging, and very illuminating discussion and conversation. So, uh, so thank you very much, Duki, and thank you, Yaron, for, for joining us and, and, and um, putting that very, very important question uh, to, um, to the very end of, uh, of our evening. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please remember that this is only the beginning of our Israeli documentary, documentary film month here at the Israeli Institute of Israel Studies. Over the next uh, coming several weeks, same time, same place, uh, every Sunday, we are going to be sharing and bringing to your screens a documentary film to be followed by a conversation with the filmmakers. And the last one in this series will be yet another film by Duki. So uh, those of you who have enjoyed and who have participated in this exchange, please come again at the end of the month on the 27th when Duki will be once again uh, our guest to discuss his film, There Are No Lions in Tel Aviv. Um, with that, I would like to bring this fascinating exchange and evening to its uh, closure. Before I would do so, I would like to extend a huge thank you to our communications and marketing team, Corey Newman and Lisa Komlos, who have been working very diligently and very uh, effectively behind the scenes to make sure that all of this that you have been part of actually will happen and, will, uh, and goes on, proceeds so seamlessly. And last but certainly not least, I would like to thank each and every one of you for your interest in Israel studies, for your passion in Israel studies, and for bringing your, that passion, that interest, and your curiosity to challenge our guest uh, tonight, Duki Dror. Duki, it was wonderful getting to know you, and we look forward to welcoming you back at the end of the month. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.